Good morning, and thank you uh, for allowing me to speak. A little longer than uh, anticipated. I'm a student uh, of Frank's, who is here somewhere. Um, but I won't be speaking about the work I'm doing in my PhD with him. I'll be speaking on a little project I did with uh, Hugo Touchet and Sanjeev, who I met for the first time in person yesterday, actually. Um, we we uh, wrote a paper together, and, and that's what I'll be speaking on. And we're continuing some work together with Frank as well. But I won't get to that. So I just want to present a very simple idea, um, which is called uh, stochastic resetting. So I want to start off um, by giving some simple examples of where this might be relevant, um, how, how this idea can be applied in, in, in nature or, or elsewhere. Then I will just define what exactly it is I'm speaking about. Um, I'll state the main result, which is a, quite a nice, simple formula. <laughs> Um, I will say a couple of words on the derivation of this result, how it, how it comes about. It's, it's, it's a very simple little calculation. And then I will, um, well, you can have a main result, but the question is always, is it useful? So we will apply it to the einstein ulimic process. And since this is a large deviations uh, theory conference, this is where the large, deviation, uh, large deviations will uh, come about. Um, then I will just quickly show a simulation that we did, which uh, sort of verifies the results, and then I'll just maybe end off with some questions that might be interesting to look at, look at in the future. So, so some examples. Uh, this idea, it wasn't called a stochastic resetting uh, then, but um, it's the birth and death processes with catastrophes. You can imagine a population, people are being born and dying, and at some point there's a hurricane or there's a uh, earthquake or something, and a large part of the population is wiped out and the system is reset to some uh, lower value. Um, another uh, area where this might be useful is in, in queuing theory. So you can imagine that you have some server that uh, is receiving customers. They arrive, and some queue builds up. And at some point, the server fails. And uh, the way the system deals with this, maybe in some cases, is to clear that whole queue and, and uh, uh, open up, fix the server and open up uh, uh, once it is fixed again. And uh, another area where this has been uh, used to optimize search strategies is in computer science. So if you're looking for, for pages on the, on the internet, then you can use this resetting idea to uh, find a, a uh, quicker search algorithm. Uh, these were in discrete space. Then you can also think about continuous space. So you have some protein searches on, a D on DNA. Um, so these typically switch between different types of diffusions to, to uh, optimally find uh, some positions along a DNA molecule. Um, then also in ecology, you have the forage of animals. So animals will go looking for food, and they'll start in some area and do sort of a, a close, sort of a, a small um, diffusion around that area. And then they will do some large jumps to another area. So you have these, these uh, local diffusions and these large jumps. Um, and then this is the inspiration uh, for, for what we did, actually. Um, I uh, looked at molecular motors in, in the cell that move biofilaments. And these are motors attached to the filament, and they have some, they're fixed somewhere. It's like a spring that walks along the filament and extends, and then pulls the filament in this way, and then detaches and resets back to a zero stretch. Um, so right, maybe, maybe it's still difficult to really get a picture of this, but I think this should clear it up. So you start at position zero. You, this is now Brown in motion with resetting. You start uh, Brown in motion, and you have, with some rate, uh, you reset to zero. And then you start again. And uh, you see um, that you have these independent diffusion segments, really, because yeah, what happens here is, is completely independent of what happens here. And so you have this um, additive structure. And this is what we will exploit. So how do we write this mathematically? So you can, you can choose your favorite stochastic differential equation, and you can add resetting to that. So in, in this case, I would say xt is the position at time t. Um, f is your drift function. Uh, sigma is your noise strength, and uh, we have the standard Brownian motion. And we have some initial condition, of course. And how do we add resetting? Well, we say in an infinitesimal time interval, um, we have a probability RDT of resetting to some reset position. So it doesn't have to be zero. We can, we can have any XR, which is the reset position. 
Um, and with probability 1 minus RDT, we, we continue with this uh, uh, stochastic differential equation. Is this clear? Right. Um, so things you might ask then is how does this modify, for example, yes? This position XR doesn't depend on T. No, XR is, is a fixed position. Well, so you can think of variations. You can say, okay, each time I reset, I'm going to draw my resetting position from some distribution. So in this case, it, it is random, but drawn from a specific distribution. And people have looked at this. One fixed point, XR. In, in my situation, it's one fixed point. Okay. So the question is, how does this modify the Fokker-Planck equation, which uh, um, gives the evolution of the probability density? And you see that you just get the standard, the standard thing here. And then you have some uh, term um, uh, RPXT, so conditioned on starting at x0. And, uh, and then you have a, a, a delta function at r. And how, do you, how can you interpret this? You can see that there's some sort of uniform sink everywhere where probability is sort of being lost. And all of this probability is being inserted again at this xr position. And, and this is always at rate r. So, some, so this was initially studied by, uh, or most recently uh, in 2011, by um, Martin Evans and Satya Majumdar. And, um, if you think about this for a while, you realize that the history is not really important if you're just interested in the position of the walker, right? Because the only thing that's important is when the last reset was and how long ago that was until the time you're looking at, right? Anything that happens before is completely irrelevant for the position. And so you can write down a solution to this equation by saying you have one term, which is um, just the, the, the density for the free uh, or without resetting. Um, times the probability of not having reset up to time t. So, right, you could not reset at all up to time t. And then you have a second term over here, um, which is the, the, the reset-free density um, for a time tau. And tau can take, tau is now the last, the period between the last reset and the time you look. And uh, this can take on the values uh, between 0 and t, because, of course, you can reset immediately at zero, or you can reset at t. So you allow all of these values. And, and this way, you can, you can write down a solution. And um, in the end, this has some, uh, some form uh, which uh, is non-differentiable at the reset position over here. Um, so another observation you can make is that this is not a system that will reach some sort of uh, equilibrium, right? Because it, it keeps restarting, so it has this, keeps being renewed. Um, but what they speak about in, in, in their paper is a non-equilibrium stationary state, which is what I've drawn over there. But uh, we are not interested in looking at the position. Yes? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. So, so this is just the last reset. Because anything before, how many, however many you had before, is, is, is doesn't matter, right? For for your for your position. But but for our problem, we will have to take care of that, and you'll you'll see. So we want to look at something we we call a time additive uh, uh, observables of a time additive form, which which are observables a t, where we have some real valued function f of x t dt. So this is what we're interested in, and immediately you see you have a you're going to encounter something more complicated because um, you, have to, you have to now consider the entire history uh, uh, to calculate this uh, observable. I'm just going to also define the generating function in this way. So EX denotes the expectation with respect to the, the reset process. And uh, the, the subscript X is the, uh, initial con uh, the initial condition. And then we define this Laplace transform. So as soon as you see a delta appearing, you mean, it means you've taken the Laplace transform in time of the generating function. And we can define the same objects also for the no reset process with r is equal to 0. Right. And now we're ready to state the main result. And that's this very simple formula. So we see that the Laplace transform generating function of the reset, the process with resetting, is related by this simple formula the Laplace transform generating function of the process without resetting. So this is a, quite a simple formula, and uh, 
I will show the derivation in a bit, but of course you have to remain skeptical because maybe this doesn't give you any real information about the process with resetting, even though you have maybe this object. Right. So, um, some words on the derivation. You can take, so if, you, if you're looking at time t, this uh, observable, um, then you can split this time from 0 to t into uh, a sum over the length of the reset periods, right? So tau i is the duration of the ith reset. Um, and we define also tau n plus 1. This is the, is the last period. So you've had the nth reset, and now you have some period tau n plus 1, which is up to the point where you are now looking at the observable. Uh, so you can split it up in this way, and then you can rewrite your, your, um, your, run, uh, your observable in this way. You can say um, you're going to integrate over these, tau, these intervals of, of length tau, and you're going to sum them up, right? So th this, is, this maybe looks a little bit scary with the sums and so on, but all you're saying is you're going to, you're going to start at tau 0, which is defined to be a 0, and then you're going to integrate from tau 0 to... Uh, tau 1. And then you're going to start at tau 1 and you're going to integrate to tau 1 plus tau 2. And then you're going to start at tau 1 plus tau 2 and you're going to integrate to tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau 3. And you're going to add these all together and, and uh, right. And then because these, these um, segments are independent, you can rewrite the reset generating function in this way. And so I want to just take some time to look at this um, on the board. So to see this, you can start off by saying, OK, let's look at um, the situation where we reset once and we specify the time at which we reset. So in that case, so I'm going to call that uh, GR1 like this. Uh, And this is what we defined as uh, uh, so we start at zero, and then these sums, so I'm going to okay, let's write it immediately from tau zero to tau one. Right, because these segments are independent, we can, we can split this into two expectations. And tau 0 is 0. And uh, then these are just the definitions of the generating functions for period tau 1 and, well, t minus tau 1. So, but we can just call this tau 2, right? Then you can say, OK, well, I need to sum. Um, I, need to, I need to, first of all, allow tau to, take, to, to happen at any point, multiplied by the probability of it happening at that point. And then I need to sum over the number of resets. Yes. Well, th yes, that's the next step. So uh, first I fix tau 1. Now I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to need to look at exactly the expectation of that. So I'm going to then take, um, 
So yeah. This is now, yeah, the averaged whatever. Yeah, this should this should be something something else. Now I'm going to uh, integrate from zero to t, uh, d tau one times the probability of seeing a reset uh, at tau one. Right. And um, I can also rewrite this as two integrals, one over d tau one Oh wait, this is uh, oh, this should be not so this is now multiplied by the probability of not seeing a reset for the remaining time, right? And uh, I can rewrite this as this multiply tau two It's clear. So I've I've added the second integral over tau two and a, a delta function and here I need this. And if we continue this for, for two resets, three resets, you end up recovering uh, this formula over here. So if you're not convinced, you can do this for yourself as an exercise. Um, right. Yeah, so this is the, the probability of not having a reset for that interval, right? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah? Is good? Yeah. Okay, good. So if you take the Laplace transform of this, I, I'm, I'm not going to... So you can also do that again, taking the, uh, just with one, so taking all the terms in the sum, doing it one by one, and you will see that you get this form. And then we say, ah, well, if uh, r g0, x r g0 tilde, x r k s plus r is smaller than one, then we have the result. Right, because then we have a geometric uh, series. No, yeah, so you don't need it, but it's, it's convenient for the Laplace transform. So you could, you could eliminate the delta. That's exactly what I, what I did over here. So I, I included the last integral with the delta function, and this turns out to be convenient in the Laplace transform calculation. Okay. <clears throat> so now uh, the question is, is this a useful result? Can we do something meaningful with this, or uh, is it just nice? And uh, we took a look at um, the einstein ullenbeck process, so we've now fixed some uh, drift function over here um, with resetting. And um, we're going to consider this additive observable, so where uh, small f of xt is just xt. Okay? And um, now I'd like to say something on the spectral decomposition because the the exact form of the generating function is known, but we cannot use it in our formula. So, so we have to write this generating function in its spectral decomposition. Um, so just a quick note on that. So we know that um, this object evolves according to um, Feynman-Katz equation. Where uh, this is equal to L plus KF and uh, L is F.
Okay? And um, so this is what's called the tilted generator. And in the OU case, this is not a Hermitian operator, but unitarily you can map it to a Hermitian operator. Um, and that ends up looking something like this. So this is again a, a, some a lengthy exercise, but uh, you can do this. And then you can identify this as a, the Schrodinger operator for a shifted and inverted quantum harmonic oscillator for which um, the uh, spectrum is known, right? So, so we can write it in this form and um, the lambdas will have this form and the psi's will have this form. So this is some complicated object involving uh, Hermite polynomials. But you can do this. Uh, you, can, you can do this calculation, and then you can look up um, what the eigenfunctions of this are. You can do the appropriate um, mapping back to, to what they should be in this case. OK? Uh, and then just a quick uh, uh, large deviations theory reminder for, for our notation, just not to confuse anybody. So uh, we say AT satisfies, oh, satisfies. The LDP, uh, this is the case. We define a scale cumulant generating function in this way. And then uh, something important is that under general conditions, the largest eigenvalue of the tilted generator um, corresponds to the scale cumulant generating function. Right, so this is going to be important for us. And this is what I had on the board a second ago. And of course, the rate function and the scale cumulant generating function are related by the Legendre Finchel transform in this way. So, if you look at this uh, equation, uh, the largest eigenvalue is going to be this one. And then, if you perform the Legendre Finchel transform, this is now for the reset free uh, uh, process, right? And uh, the corresponding rate function is, is this one. And now, our question is. How does introducing resetting modify these, these objects? Um, for, the, for the reset process, this is what I mentioned earlier. The generating function in a large deviation sense uh, is approximated like this. And then if you take the Laplace transform, um, we have this. And now this is the important observation and why this equation that I wrote previously, this main result, is useful at all. Because then the scale cumulant generating function for the, for the process with resetting uh, um, corresponds to the largest pole of the equation, the largest pole in S of the equation of the main result. Right? OK. So we have this uh, uh, expression for the uh, uh, reset free generating function here. But this is, of course, an infinite sum of some complicated objects, so we, we cannot expect to use the entire sum in our equation. But we can, we can I mean, initially you can say, OK, well, we're looking for, for large deviations, so we can just take the first, uh, um, the first term in the sum. If you take the first term, you see that uh, the scale cumulative generating function you get is, a, is, not, is not valid. But interestingly, it's sort of, for large k, it is, sort of. And as you include higher orders in the sum, you see you converge to a scale cumulant generating function, which is this green function over here. And then you can take the, the genre Fenchel transform and you can uh, calculate the rate function. And here we see this is the modified rate function with resetting, and this is the old rate function. So, so resetting in some way has a confining effect. It's sort of, uh, uh, which is to be expected. So this makes sense. Now you can say, OK, well, what if my reset position is not at 0? Because this is now all nice at 0, the resetting position at 0. Uh, we did that as well. And then you see that this rate function is shifted, as well as uh, confined. 
So some comments on this. The small, so we see if, if we just include this, the, the first term in the uh, spectral decomposition of the herding function, then we see that the small fluctuations are, are terribly wrong. So we see that uh, small fluctuations in the rate function, they come from paths where there have been many resets. And so you cannot expect the, the, the first term in the spectral decomposition to be enough. You, you're going to need to include more. Um, but the fluctuations are still Gaussian and they have some modified variance. The large fluctuations, they are immediately correct, right? So, um, and we can see this um, quite simply because um, if we just take the first uh, term in the sum, of the spectral decomposition, plug it into our main result, then we find that uh, for that this is the case. So this is, of course, not the correct object. But if you naively plug in the first term, this is what you, what you obtain. And, and we have an uh, explicit expression for this, which is um, And if we now look at the large k limit, we see that this reduces to, so as k goes to infinity, this reduces to and, and this makes sense because um, the, the large fluctuations, so when you have a steep scale equivalent generating function, they come from paths where you have very few reset or no reset. Um, and so you expect it to be the, the reset-free scale cumulative generating function. Um, and then you have to add the probability of seeing those events, which is where this minus r comes from. So another thing we see is that there's some, some competition between the drift, which is trying to, uh, which is, uh, trying to contain the particle, as well as the resetting rate. And this gives, uh, in, the, in the intermediate region of the rate function, a non-parabolic rate function. So uh, another question you could ask is, how does the, the zero of the rate function change uh, as you change the resetting position? And you see that there's a linear relation between these two. Um, in fact, the minimum of the rate function approaches the, reach, the reset position uh, as you increase r. Um, given that gamma is fixed. So this is this competition. So you could always then increase r, but so if your position, say, is at uh, 0 0.5, and the drift is, of course, trying to contain you to 0, then there's some competition. So if you increase r, which is going to try and keep the particle at the reset position, then you can always also increase gamma to try and pull the particle very quickly back uh, to 0. So you need, you need to uh, fix gamma, and then if r goes to infinity, the minimum approaches the recent position. So um, to check that this was all uh, uh, correct, I did some uh, Monte Carlo simulations and uh, for different times, um, blue being the, the lowest time and red being the highest, and we see indeed this concentration onto the rate function um, for the process with resetting. For both the zero, uh, position, reset position, and non-zero reset position. And um, I'd like to end with a, a couple of questions that one could uh, maybe consider. Um, so one question is, what, right, resetting has some, some confining effect, and run in motion uh, uh, does not obey a large deviation principle, but if you include resetting, could this perhaps introduce a large deviation principle. And uh, for now, we think that this is probably not the case because the large deviations are still um, produced by uh, paths with no resetting. And so you expect them to scale uh, 
uh, in a different way than the small um, uh, fluctuations. Another question is, can we generalize this to current type observables? Um, then can, this, can we apply this to other processes? The einstein ullenbeck process was uh, a nice one to consider because uh, um, we have the spectral decomposition, the generating function, and so on, and things work out nicely, but can this be done, for example, for reflected Brownian motion or some other nice uh, processes? And um, the question is, could one obtain a similar result when one does this thing where you, where you pick the resetting position from some distribution uh, each time you reset? Then, of course, you, you don't get that geometric series because now each generating function has a different XR, and so you cannot do the same thing. Uh, and then you can think of things like introducing some time penalty when you're, when you're not moving, and it's, um, when you reset, you have some random time penalty, and, and so forth. And uh, then this is the paper we wrote, and this is the result of the uh, non-equilibrium stationary state. And you can look at references within these papers if you are interested to learn more. Thank you. So the steady state only, so the steady state I spoke about before, you mean? At the beginning, yeah. there is a steady state, so this interval will converge in my Yeah, so, no, because the, the, the time additive, uh, so the, this averaged uh, observable depends on the entire history, while this stationary state depends only on the last reset and what happened since then. So you, f you forget the entire history. This is not encoded in this stationary uh, state. Yeah, or somewhere else. Well, this non-equilibrium stationary state that I spoke about earlier. Yeah, so, so then at some point you have some probability distribution telling you where the particle is. So, um, it's called non equilibrium station. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but um, so um, in that case, there's no generating function. But the free case. Yeah. But uh, the so free in, should have. Uh, I mean, okay. I mean, you can't use the same method, but. No, you can't use the same method. But, but this is so. This is an interesting thing that we would like to look at. Yeah. You can't apply this method. But there seems to be so. This that's what I was saying. So there seems to be a different scaling for smaller fluctuations. So. So the rate function scales differently in T uh, for large and small fluctuations. And so you cannot, you don't have one large deviation principle for, with one rate uh, uh, across. A. Yeah? Yes. Um, Yeah, I mean, you can, you can do the same thing, but I, I don't know if it's... So you have, you have some set tau, and after tau you reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, so, it's, so you can just um, see how many times you see this process, and then it's the same thing over and over. So I guess you can just... Some of them. Is there no further questions? Let's try to speak again.